We are live on Facebook. <laughs> and I am Love Coach Scott Katamas, along with Trish, or is it Christoph? Um, well, with the mustache, it's Christoph. <laughs> no, it's actually Jonathan. Jonathan. Um, and I'm Trish Wright, Love Coach Trish Wright. And... We'll work on that. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a filter, okay, so here we go. This is an interesting start to our show. Tonight's show is actually about an incredibly important topic. We, um, on Saturday Night Live, a couple weeks ago, we had a show on social and racial justice. And obviously it's impossible to even begin to really go in depth in an inspirational variety show. Um, and so we invited Reverend Rich Feltis to really come in and to go deep. And we're gonna, I, I have some really hard questions I wanna ask her. Um, at age 65, white privileged man, and still learning all the ways that I have inherent racial prejudice, um, the ways that I still have inherent racist thoughts. And it's, a, it's, it's humbling as somebody who wants to live a spiritual life. So we're gonna talk about that with Reverend Bridge Feltis. And to introduce Reverend Bridge Feltis, my partner Trish. I don't have your bio pulled up, to be really honest, but I'll just speak from- Oh, just wing it. I will. <laughs> um, this human is truly one of the most compassionate people I know and have taken her amazing course. If you guys saw my post, read that post because if you want to know what you got out of it, but you can get out of this course. This is the one. But Reverend Bridge is, you are so compassionate and you are so loving and your teachers are also just deeply loving and compassionate. Um, you hold multiple high degrees in metaphysics from places I have no idea where from. <laughs> I'll let you speak to that. And you, the way that you, the way that you hold your students through the, t the work that you do is with such grace and with such profound integrity. I have not met anyone with as much like mm, as you I, there, there's a there's like a, a word I'll, I'll come up with it i'll, I'll think of it <laughs> and i want to just welcome um a lot of our friends a lot of our regulars who are in our zoom room with us and for anybody watching on facebook come on into the zoom room because that's where you can ask questions it'll be easier i will periodically be checking facebook but i pretty much want to stay really connected uh into our zoom room tonight but if you do want to come into the Zoom room, it is 9800684239. So get ready to write it down again. I'll say it again. You, if you want to come to the Zoom room, it's Zoom room S9800684239. And hello to many, many of our friends that are with us that are kind of regulars. And I will definitely be taking questions and comments um, from the chat box. Um, and as we already have some, some great comments. Thank you, Eleanor, Dia, uh, and also let us know where you're from. It's always good to see, even though I, I know half of you by now, but let us know where you're from. All right, Bridge, I wanna go right into something we were talking about just before the show went on. Yes. And that was this idea, well, not all white people are racist. And, <laughs> um, and of course, my guess, and this is just a guess, I might be doing another white thing right now, is that we don't have the intention to be racist. We don't have the intention to be hurtful, but we're ignorant about how our languaging and our thinking actually is still inherently racist. Would that be accurate? I would say yes. And can you imagine how that's probably more dangerous? Imagine how, if you don't know that certain behaviors um, or not just behaviors, ways of thinking or um, just conditioning in general um, creates, perpetuates, promotes and supports um, racist systems because really the most, um, the most damaging thing is that we live in a society that is comprised of systems that are meant to benefit a specific group of people. 
and the that group of people um, profit from racism, from sexism, from classism, and and most people in this society don't profit from it. However, there was a, a time in this country, um, let's say near the somewhere near the the middle of slavery, uh, the history of slavery, when the poor white people who came here um, on a debt, who had to allegedly pay off the debt for that cross, that, that uh, Atlantic crossing by working as indentured servants, um, realized that they were, they could come together with the African people and the Native American people and turn against the rich white people who were um, basically enslaving them and treating, not treating them fairly, not giving them a fair wage. And when that happened, well, um, the rich white slave owners decided to um, create a system Called, ra called race, called whiteness. Nobody was called, no Europeans were called white prior to that. And white poor people were convinced via fear and uh, a desire to be able to thrive to separate themselves from the other people working on those plantations. Um, basically for a small penance and the, the promise that they would not be treated as viciously as the, the African slave and the Native American were treated. And that created whiteness. There was no such thing prior to that. There was racism um, in the form of eugenics and things like that, but they didn't distinguish white in that way. They talked about um, people of color in other places call them savages and barbarians and things like that. But they didn't distinguish someone as white because they also uh, were racist in the beginning against Italian people, Irish people, Spanish people as well. And really anyone who was poor was treated badly. So Europe, um, the cultures of Europe were very feudalist, um, all kinds of torture and <laughs> hanging and chopping off heads in the town square and millions of women burned at the stake um, or, murder, or murdered for their plant medicine and indig in European indigenous practices. So there was a, a years, I would say a millennia long um, attack on anything connected to the earth, anything connected to uh, being, being uh, grounded in the earth and earth medicine and earth practices, um, basically to sort of scare people into Christianity and into serving the the affluent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's it's tragic, and that's a whole other show talking about <laughs> how they rewrote the Bible in 321 A.D. and took out all of the references to reincarnation and holistic things that were taught. Oh yeah, and and all all of the information about Mary Magdalene. Yeah, and, turned Mary Magdalene into a whore, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's unbelievable. And how a whore manages to, you know, <laughs> be Jesus's favorite person. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's interesting, right? Um, yeah. So, for me, when I'm looking out at the world, I'm seeing a lot of chaos because people don't understand this fundamental thing that white privilege is a trick. It's, it's a, a, a fear-based trick and it has created almost a cult-like and, and for a lot of people unconscious cult-like attachment to this invisible thing that if they're confronted, they don't even, they can't even say where they have it because they don't experience what it's like to not have it. Right. But if, if you ask someone, do they want to be black? 
and, and experience life as a Black person, most people would say probably not, right? So um, there's a level of, I don't know. I mean, for most people, I think it's, I really do think it's unintentional. I think there's a level of avoidance and aversion to the conversation because what it means is we have to look at um, some really painful and uh, charged issues. I would say that racism, sexism, um, patriarchy, and uh, classism are all part of the same structural um, container created to benefit a small group of people and everybody else. Well, in America, the thing is, <laughs> there's the, that American dream thing, right? Where people come from all over the world because of this American dream, it's like a big PR thing. Mm. <laughs> because at some point we actually needed, well, I say we very loosely, right. but this country and, and it's affluent needed more workers and they could no longer enslave people. So, oh, now we have the American dream. Everybody come, you're tired, you're poor, <laughs> you're mm -hmm. longing to be free. Right. Oh, but when you get here, if you have a strange name, you have to change your name. Oh, it, when you get here, if you, um, if you are brown skinned, there's a, only a certain few things that you're allowed to do in this country as a profession. Um, so, you know, and <laughs> over the years, there have been fluctuations and changes and shifts of this, this whole thing. And I, I feel like um, most of what's happened has been just morphing of that system. So th this is where it starts. So most of the people that are gonna watch this show are well-intentioned white people. What are the steps, all right, that you would like to see us take to have the conversation? And what are the steps you'd like to see us take to change things? Can I say one thing first? Okay. Absolutely. I would just like to say that intention means nothing. You can be well-intentioned, and you, we've all heard intention is the road to hell. <laughs> is paved the road to hell is paved with good intentions and yeah that's true because i could intend to be the most amazing amazing person and have all this like how do i help and da da da, da which is pretty much allyship right and the harm that i can cause you know what's more important than intention scott impact absolutely of impact Absolutely. So just because we're like, oh my God, I want to be friends with everyone and I want the whole world to be peaceful and loving doesn't mean that I'm not stepping on toes and, and just burning people. Well, if you live in this country, you benefit from the labor of brown skinned people. Yes. No matter how hard you work in your job, you benefit from the labor, from the deaths and, and, and subjugation and slavery of brown skinned people. Yes. You benefit from it. There's no way to come to this country and, and have the American dream without benefiting from those things. This country became the power that it is economically because of the bodies used, and not just bodies, but also the, the uh, technological, agricultural, um, scientific uh, knowledge of brown skinned people who came to this country and did the work that those rich white slave owners, I like to call them human traffickers because that's what they are, what they were, um, they, they used them to get rich. The cotton industry, the, uh, the, the rice industry in, in, in the Carolinas, these are the, the two biggest industries in the early years of the forming of this nation. And, um, those industries made this country able to get off the ground and, and create wealth. So, um, We're still and it's still happening. We had a, a young Absolutely. woman on Saturday Night Live a few months ago, who's now 14. And she was in Nepal and she was uh, working in a children's 
she's an orphan working in a children's sweatshop. And Absolutely. And persecuted her out of it. And she described the conditions where if they don't make a certain quota of their clothing every day, they don't get food. That's they work right. about 12 to 14 hours a day, seven days a week, all sleeping on cots in a very hot room without air conditioning. And the clothes, many of the clothes that we're wearing, possibly the shirt I'm wearing, because I don't know where it came from. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't done, I haven't gotten into that level of consciousness to track mm -hmm. where the mm -hmm. clothes are coming from. Um, and she said that there are currently 40 million, 40 million. That's just in Nepal. And we're not talking about cell phones or chocolate or diamonds or anywhere that imports, you know, the, these large co companies and even small companies are importing items and that we buy. Yeah, if you if you think about um, unemployment in this country and that people are having trouble finding work, well, the two main uh, reasons for that, I believe personally are, first of all, technology is advancing faster than our society can keep up with or has kept up with. And then the second thing is the um, exporting of the labor. You know, ex exporting, uh, sending our, our manufacturing overseas somewhere where people will work for barely anything. So, you know, <laughs> if we can't get uh, the American people to slave, then they take that somewhere else and then mark the, the cost of the thing up so far that, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. And that we're in this country fighting for uh, right now, the big debate is the $15 uh, minimum wage. Nobody can even live off of $15. It's preposterous that that's the argument. It should be much higher. I mean, we know, we actually know that no one can live in this country off of a $15 an hour wage. Unless they do something illegal to supplement their income. Sure. Or multiple jobs. Or, or multiple jobs. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, and right. Home. Which means you, you can't uh, go to school. You can't uh, raise a family. You, you, there's so many things you cannot do on a $15 an hour job. And um, it keeps people suppressed. That's part of why that's the conversation is because if we keep people impoverished on the physical plane, then we can control them. Right, so um, it's all a part of the design of this society and it is literally designed. It's not an accident. This is not some random fluke. This is years and years, decades and decades, centuries and centuries of design and perfecting that design so that there's a complex web of control and manipulation of our minds. So while we talk about getting free in the spiritual, in the spiritual uh, world that I live in, people are constantly talking about getting free and, and uh, you know, overcoming, you know, mind over matter and all these things, right? Well, most of the people that I know who manage to use such bypassing as a, as a, a, a ticket to freedom have privilege. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, you know, it's not available. It, those things are not accessible to someone who on a daily basis, when they leave their home, they have to deal with the anxiety and trauma of their life being in danger just because of the color of their skin. This is a lot. I have a, I have a brown skinned son who's mm -hmm. 24 years old and oh. he has anxiety. You must have anxiety. You must, every time he's out. I, I do. Frankly, and I do. Um, the thing that keeps me somewhat grounded is my spiritual practice, but that doesn't protect him from the police. I can't bypass that and wish that away. And it's not, he's a beautiful person. Listen. Very much so. And, and even if he wasn't, he doesn't deserve to die. He doesn't deserve for his life to be in danger. So. Be living in fear. Yeah, he deserves so much better. He he's the nicest young man. <laughs> he, and he's super smart. He's beautiful. He's 
<laughs> Everybody loves him. <laughs> Choking up. <laughs> I, I'll let you take some water. And I wonder, would you like to read comments, select comments um, from our sure. parents? And Mark wrote something that I presume we can bring it back to my question of what, what can we do next, but it's kind of connected here. Mark writes, I know that if I open up and listen carefully, I'm going to react emotionally to what is said. So I'm going to ride the feelings and integrate them into a greater synthesis of being. Letting people express without confrontation immediately is very difficult for privileged people. It's time for us to take it in for a while so that we can find the energetic balance and can equalize. Okay, now I'm going to listen. So thank you, Mark. So to go back to your question about what do we do next, I also want to throw in sort of the, um, what I'm noticing in the spiritual community and some of the, you know, the non-dualist psychology based people are debating the, and, and the people who are withdrawing their kids from school because they don't want to teach them critical race theory. Like they're debating on whether like, race is a social construct so why are we continuing to talk about it hmm. that it is a that it is that because we're bringing up race it becomes we're, we're, we're how am i trying to say this we're actually creating more racism and more duality um i'll be frank with you the only people i hear say that are white or, yeah. or, or there are people of color who are privileged and and attached to that privilege I mean, that's across the board. That's I've never heard someone um, who's not privileged in some way say that. And and what it is is a protection of their comfort zone. It's a a, protect, a protection. So I don't it, whether I talk about it or not. It's true. It's happening. Uh, I believe the statistic is every twenty eight hours on average, a black person is killed by police or vigilantes. Mm -hmm. Extra judicially, whether they have committed a crime or not, every 28 hours. And no matter how you uh, try and turn that, it's not okay. It's absolutely not okay. Um, I, whether we talk about it or not, that's happening. For, for, for people who live with this, not talking about it doesn't change it. It's happening. People are being people. People were um, in a huge uproar. Uproar about. Oh, I'm sorry, Trish. I'm going to bring it up. I'm going to. I'm going to just bring up Cosby just for a moment, because I'm pissed. I'm pissed. I frankly think he should be in jail. Okay. And listen, <laughs> the 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 loophole he got out of it on is uh, a, a a tool that is used day in and day out to, to coerce and, and under duress, send people to jail who, are, who would not have been found guilty. People are constantly getting put in jail even when they're not guilty because they get scared into taking a plea deal. Mm -hmm. So, and a plea, de plea deal does not actually rectify the wrongdoing. There's no justice in that. So what's happening is out of a, a need to meet quotas or whatever the reason is, um, because they want to close the case, they offer a plea deal. If, if there's a, a, a iota of, of uh, suspicion that they might lose if it goes to court, they offer a plea deal because they want to put that person away. They just want it to be done. And so this is how we got the uh, Central Park Five mm -hmm. who were boys who were accused of rape and they had not raped anyone. They were boys just messing around in the park. They were put away until they were adults, middle-aged traumatized adults. Some of them are so severely traumatized that, that they can't even speak normal. So, you know, the, this plea deal thing, I have a real problem with. If you can't uh, find someone guilty based on the law 
and based on <laughs> you know the legal system as it stands, then you shouldn't be able to to put them in jail. Period. You shouldn't be scaring them into plea deals. Yes. Because what it also does is it lets people go free, mm -hmm. like Bill Cosby, who's free right now because in a previous case he took a plea deal that promised him he would never be prosecu prosecuted. Ah. So it lets people go free or uh, get lesser sentences for things that they should get longer sentences for. And it also puts people, it, it incarcerates people who are not even guilty because they're afraid. So back to the big question. <laughs> what, what, what are specific steps you'd like to see me take? You'd like to see so, our tribe take? Well, Scott, I would invite you to come take my course. I, I'm biased. I don't think that there's any course out there like mine. There are some that are a little bit similar, but that are not as thorough as mine is. Um, educating yourself is important. So if, if, you, um, if you actually care and your intention is to disrupt this, first, you got to admit that it's happening, that it exists. It's happening. And, and you can't, just because we don't want to claim victimhood or, or, or saviorhood or any of those things doesn't stop it from being actually real. You know, this is happening. People are being killed. People are being starved. People are, are suffering. So to, to first acknowledge that there's something to learn and then to invest in the learning because otherwise, you know, we're already probably looking at a long many years of shift before this ends. So what, what, what I think that what I think is is really important to share is that it, it's a confirmation bias. Whiteness is a confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. So as the reason why this is how I see it. Just sort of like how my opinion is that the reason why people get so upset it's because around, you know, like, I can say that I'm inherently racist now and know that that's true because I, of the way that I was taught throughout the, throughout my youth, through the language I was taught because my mom was and my, their parents were and like, it, it just is. And there's nothing wrong with me learning what happened before me because what, I, what we're being taught in school is... <laughs> What we're being taught in school is a very whitewashed his history. I don't want that anymore. I actually feel really fucking lied to. And I'm really still mad about it. I'm really well, still you mad. have been lied to. Lied to I, and with information with, withheld from you. And that's a form not, of oppression. Exactly. So, so let's we're be real here. Oppressed. White people are oppressed as well. We're and, all being oppressed by the, the white supremacist, the white supremacy. It's like, right. oh, the fe being a female. And, and being oppressed as being, just because I woke up in the, a badge having body, well, thanks, great. Like, I didn't choose that. You didn't choose the color of your skin. You didn't choose yours. So the confirmation bias around, um, like, my reality is true. And the only reality is. And so when we, we touch the, the racist piece or the gender piece, like we're going to have a, a transgender show soon. Like, if we touch that, it really touches people's reality. You know what? what? Here's the thing, Trish. I, I, you know, we start out the course the first week and a half. We don't even talk about race. Nope. We talk about humility, yes. um, beginner's mind, yes. integrity, and uh, forming a relationship with your body. Yes. And we do that because there are foundational things that allow this to be the case. What you're describing is so because we've been taught to think that way for centuries for generations for generations generation for generations and our parents have passed it on because they thought it was the best thing for us to survive in this world is they to didn't be know any better yeah so so we really have to get to a place where we can um let go of the idea that um we are separate from anybody else. That's one thing. Um, secondly, that 
uh, saying that you're that you're racist or that you have racist conditioning doesn't make you a villain. No. And if that's your only concern is what other people think of you, then you, you're not even there yet. There's so much fear around that victim, savior, villain, uh, villain complex. This Cartman drama triangle is what it's called. Uh, there's so much uh, aversion to that because there was a time when if you were just affiliated with certain people, you could be killed in the town square. Yes. There was a time when if you got caught doing plant medicine, you could be burned at the stake. I mean, this is all programmed. The fear of punishment in a punitive society is it's alive and well. So this is, you know, that's also there when we talk about shaming people <laughs> or cancel culture. Listen, when did it become okay as a practitioner of something to be abusive to people without uh, there being any any call out or any um, uh, accountability held? Like that you can't even hold anyone accountable anymore because if they are embarrassed or ashamed, then you've shamed them apparently. Well, personally, nobody can shame me. I can only be ashamed of myself. And, where, and I don't do that? that. I don't even actually do shame. I don't believe in shame. I don't believe in guilt. And these are things that are that are programmed into our society. We are taught things that you should be ashamed when something. Uh, when much, how many times will it talk shame on you? Now this, yes. this is the whole. There's a lot of topics to talk about. <laughs> the whole Christian church, the yeah. whole history versus her story, and now shaming. But we got to we understand that. that. Before we did do that, I do want to go to your website because you told me the best thing to do is to take your course. So I do want to talk about that. I'm, I'm going to do this twice uh, in case anybody misses it. So we're going to do it halfway through the show. And again, um, so you've got this course. Um, again, people go to the rememberinstitute.com. Rememberinstitute.com. You have an open house coming up. Well, it's an ongoing open yes the, the open the house, house is automated you can visit it anytime 24 7. so um, that thing to do, you go to go to the campus menu and go to the open house all of that and then once we realize okay i got to do this it's the heal thyself course and that's, that's what's coming up in august yeah yes all right i'm clicking on it and people who sign up before the 4th of August get a 30% discount as well. So I see it's five ninety nine. dollars um, Yes. And normally, and the normal price then would be probably... Well, no, that is the normal price. And then it's 30% off of that. Oh, okay, great. All right. Yeah. All right. And we, all right, so... We make the, the cost of this uh, somewhat reasonable. And, uh, you know, but I got to pay my teachers. We have... Uh, all of our teachers are people who are members of marginalized groups. They are also multi-lettered. Um, <laughs> we've got someone who is a, um, a community conflict resolution specialist who con consults uh, city governments and uh, lo their local residents when there's a, a big uh, crisis happening. So like when Ferguson happened or St. Louis or uh, uh, Oakland, any, any of these big crisis moments, um, this particular teacher of ours goes in to consult with the people and the local government so that everybody gets what they need um, in the situation so nobody gets hurt. Um, we also have someone who is a priest of the uh, Dagara lineage. He, he's from the, uh, from the, also, who's also a, a Tai Chi Qigong teacher. Um, we have, a, all three of our, our other teachers are sociologists, by the way. And um, so again, multi-lettered, multi-skilled, multi-dimensional beings who are also margin in parts of marginalized groups. Um, I'm gonna go back to the website just for a moment so people can understand what it is. It's um, the first week, August 18th to the 22nd, onboarding. And then the course actually runs from August 23rd to October 7th. Live sessions at 12 noon on Wednesdays, um, three hours, I recall. 
Yes. The first two yeah. hours are lecture and then the last hour is question and answer period. And um, uh, Trish, you just took the course. So what can you tell people about it? Well, I'm going to read the notes that I took because that's just easiest for me. <laughs> um, I'm still working through a bunch of things. She has sit earlier on the couch before like before dinner. She was like, I'm still working on this course. It's so much for me. I'm actually going to go take it some time by myself to actually like just, just, just so here. I'll just tell you what I'm working on right now. And this will help you. I'm working on the intersection between eugenics, choosing your own, your partner and actually how authentic it is. Like, is it actually authentic for me when I choose a partner or is it some thing that was taught to me? Like, why am I attracted to what am I attracted to? And the, yeah, I'm, I'm a little like, Can you imagine how important this is. It's, yes. it's, gosh, we're so blinded when we get coupled up with someone. And, and this is, I think, one of the reasons why so many people are out of, uh, they're not compatible with their partners because they don't know how to choose. And they don't realize that they have all kinds of bias and aversion that keeps them from the right partners for them and also attracts them to and has them attracted to, uh, has the partner attracted to them who's not right for them. You know, Harville Hendricks, I just wanted to say this while this for a second. Mm -hmm. um, Harville Hendricks is a wonderful author who's written a lot about this, a lot about the Imago and the psychological attraction that we have. Mm -hmm. We have to break out of our Imago to find actually an authentic partner who has similar values, so um, where, there's, where it's not built on sexual attraction or making babies, but it's built on really shared values and having something that we do together in our partnership that's greater yeah. than either of us. Yeah, and a lot of people don't realize they have uh, aversions and they also have preferences that are not aligned with truth. They're often uh, re results of trauma or bad experiences from the past that don't have them make clear choices. Or programming. Like yeah. I'm realizing that half the things that I'm attracted to and how I've chosen a lot of my the partners and the lovers in my life haven't been my own my own choice. It's just like some patterning and some mm -hmm. construct that I was living into. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's a reason why we like toxic men. Mm -hmm. I mean, just using mm -hmm. that as an example. Yeah. So I here's some things that you get from this course. Heal thyself a hold on, I want to get it right. A transformative initiation for people racialized as white. So things that I got out of it, and you're probably going to get your own set of awesome whoa <laughs> from it. And that is how I've intentionally participated in perpetuating white supremacy. And you, you see me as a, an, I'm a nice girl. I love it's people. Nice I'm girl. compassionate. <laughs> and I still have perpetuated white supremacist thoughts and behaviors and, and systems. By the way, so have I. I know, we all have. Oh, that's so brave to say, thank you. Thank you. I, it's the truth. Um, how to move forward without guilt and shame of my ancestral past. It's given me an opportunity to see how to love even better. To love, like really love, not like the whatever love we, we think we, we're doing. How to live in a more integrated, how to live more integrated and in a community focused society how to compassionately approach my family, friends, community in their self-discovery and awareness. So if you want to know how to, like, how to work through the racism on, and come out on the other side with the majority of racist people who have no desire to, to change or need to change, well, you change from here. And then everyone around you, because you're talking about it, because it's coming up for you, that's how you change everyone. Just saying, I mean. Totally, I mean, the fact that nobody wants to talk about it should be a sign that we need to talk about it. Yeah. Um, understanding that in order to achieve equality, we have to focus on leveling up the equity. Um, what we do individually impacts others. What we do individually impacts others, regardless of your intention. If you didn't catch that piece, go back and listen to the front of the section of it. I want to say real quick right there, um, some of these stories in the news about police officers who snap and, and lose it and, and end up killing someone. 
Um, some of that is because they're not consciously aware and no one's expecting them to be consciously aware and no one's training them to be consciously aware and nor are they given the tools in order to de-escalate those, those uh, impulses in themselves. So, you know, the, again, Black Lives Matter is not about hating cops. It's about the system needing to change. Yeah. So what, what do you say when people do bring up like with Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. of course, there's the classic retort, well, all lives matter. Mm -hmm. um, now, I personally have strong feelings about it, but I'd love to hear it from you. When some well-intentioned person mm -hmm. says that back to you, what's your response? And, and do you have to manage your own anger or your own emotional <laughs> response in order to be humane in your response to that person? I, I used to have to do that. And then I decided to stop doing it. I have a lot of white friends. I, I, I have a lot of, um, there are a lot of circles that I move through. Um, I like to think of myself as being eclectic. I was raised um, to be that way and to be able to navigate different spaces uh, with different kinds of people. So I have that in my background and I would, by the way, say that that's a privilege. So don't expect that all black people have that. Um, it is, I have grown up with some privilege. So, um, what I what happened was uh, when uh, let's see who was it. Well, let's let's say I think it was around the time Philando Castile was shot. Um, a bunch of my white friends were starting to lose their cool, and were in my inbox constantly wanting to debate with me. Mm -hmm. And this is by the way after what happened to my cousin, and even though they knew about what happened to my cousin. They were still in my inbox with these really obnoxious questions. And, you know, I was answering those questions as best way, as best as I could. And um, they would argue with me. They wouldn't just accept what I was saying to them. They would argue with all of the, all of the bias and uh, avoidance and, you know, saying these things are mean to say and, you know, that's victim mindset. I'm like, actually, no, it's not. <laughs> I'm actually standing up for myself and, and uh, for my people and, and also for all of us because nobody wins. Nobody wins here. Not even those people who are profiting off of this system, they don't actually win. So uh, at one point I had this friend who was really just on my last nerve. <laughs> Let's just call it. <laughs> she was on my last nerve. And I said, you know what? I, I'm, I'm actually not gonna have this conversation anymore because it was taking up a lot of my time. And I was in the process of creating the first courses for Remember Institute. And um, I decided, okay, let me put these courses aside and take all the information from those courses, which were spirit, they were spiritually based uh, spiritual practices and distinctions that I wanted to teach because I believe they're the foundation of uh, most suffering is, is to know these things. So I took those, those principles and I applied them to this topic. And in two weeks I created Heal Thyself. Um, and then I offered that woman who, by the way, very frequently told me that she loved me, um, very frequently said that, you know, claimed to not be racist and didn't know anything about racism, or at least that's the way it seemed. So I created this course and I invited her to take it and she declined. And then within a, a week, I believe it was, she had unfriended me on social media. Oh. And yeah, I mean, this is someone who allegedly loved me, <laughs> you know? And I, I didn't take it personally because I kind of knew that that was gonna happen. I actually wanted her to stop. And um, I decided that I was not gonna do this anymore, have these conversations anymore without some sort of reciprocity because it was very hard on me, you know, to, to stay open all the time and, and feel the abuse of the dismissal constantly over and over again. It's, it's really rough. And the only reason I was able to do it as long as I was is because I have privilege. Mm. 
you know, I've spent a lot of money and time on my personal development and spiritual uh, development. I have privilege. So I was fortified, right? So um, just imagining someone uh, with my color skin having those conversations and having any patience at all, you can forget it. Most people don't have the patience for it. And if they, by the way, y'all, if they're your friends and they're a person of color and they tell you they don't see racism or they don't experience it, um, I'm going to say that probably seven times out of 10, they're saying that because they don't want to have that conversation with you. Mm. And the other, the other three are, are probably attached to things as they are. They're attached to the status quo. So, you know, I, I mean, it is what it is. And um, I am, listen, I, I have practices that have me be committed to being a stand for everyone's greatness. So when I speak to someone, I speak to them from a place of their potential greatness. I don't speak to them from a place of judgment. I don't speak to them from a place of con condemnation. I speak to the possibility of their opening and their greatness. Um, because <laughs> I don't know how else to stay sane in this world. If, if you cannot imagine uh, the possibility of growth, then where are we going? Like that's pretty depressing to not to not actually choose to believe that we can we can do better. We can. And Thanks for loving us that way. Oh, that's so love. That's like that's we love. Are, we are one, and that's me loving myself. Again, it's not victim mindset, and it's not charity. It's not. Um, it's not me feeling sorry for white people. It's not me. Uh, being rosy eyed or anything like that. I happen to know that when I um, show up and interact with people in a certain way and um, I come prepared and I have done my homework and I, I bring forth uh, compelling evidence and compelling conversation that change happens. And so those, those practices and principles that I applied to this work actually make the conversation uh, digestible. It's not easy to digest, but it can be done. Um, it's not easy to talk about these things, but people are doing it. We've gotten close to 300 people through the course at this point. It's been two and a half years. And um, you know, we've had maybe two people out of those 300 some odd people leave the course in the middle of it. And typically it was because it was the workload of it was challenging for them. Um, and we've maybe had one or two people leave for, <laughs> because they were too resistant to actually let it in. But we have, we have a teacher who does 15,000 years of history. Um, and some of it people are shocked by because they weren't taught that in school and they go and they look it up and they find that it's actually true. Um, we, we have uh, one teacher who talks about the relationship between racism and how we, how we relate to our own bodies. All people, white people, black people, everyone um, has, a, we all have this, you know, this is why somatics and embodiment practices are so hot right now because we have a dysfunctional relationship with our physical self. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, and, and, and even all the sex work that's happening, all of this is related. Like, how can you have healthy sexual interaction when you live in a society from birth that teaches you to disconnect from your body, that teaches you that, that you're disconnected from all other living things? You know, that, that you don't have to be responsible for anything. You can just show up and let some stranger you never see or never talk to uh, decide everything for you. So we are disconnected. We're disassociated by, by birth, from birth, we begin to be taught how to disassociate. So this leads to a question I really want to ask you. And it's based on something I heard you say, yes, um, say a little while ago. Mm -hmm. That was that you no longer have shame or guilt. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. which puts you in a very small fraction of the world's population, at least I'll say American population, the people that I interact with. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd love to hear, if you're willing, to share a little bit about your journey of becoming shame free and if you have any tools or practices that you offer. And is that incorporated into your, into the Hill the Self course? Yes. yes. One of the things I teach is integrity. And the first thing about integrity for me is discerning what that is. Integrity is wholeness. And um, how do I determine wholeness? How do I determine when everything is in its place? Well, first of all, um, let me just talk about my own behavior, my own actions, my own choices. Um, when, I'm, when I uh, make a decision about uh, which way to go, I ask myself, is it, is it based, is it aligned with the truth? And is it of service to myself and others? Mm -hmm. so, so this is one piece. Is it, hang on, just, is it aligned with the truth? Yeah. And is it in service to myself and to others? Yeah. And, and don't get me wrong. I may get embarrassed. I sometimes get embarrassed. Okay. I make a mistake. I may be embarrassed by it. But the practice of, of integrity as I teach it has within it, um, we don't do apologies either. We don't say, I'm sorry. We, I mean, you can say you're sorry if that's the way you feel. Um, however, sorry is not as important as acknowledging what you did and the impact of it. And Absolutely. Yes, creating a, a, a plan for reparation, so repairing the damage, and what can you do to prevent it from happening in the future? Those, that's it. N most people don't care about you feeling bad. They really don't. They only want you to feel bad because they think if you feel bad, you won't do it again because that's the kind of society we live in that teaches you that you should feel bad or you should be afraid of bad feeling in order to control your behavior. But how about is it is it true and is it of service and and am I uh, is the impact that I'm having the desired impact that I want to have and uh, most people would say that they don't want to be a negative impact mm -hmm. in the world in fact some people so much don't want to be a negative impact especially in spiritual communities now they've got this huge bypass that they don't have to be they're not responsible for their impact anymore like and also the essence of codependency yeah and, uh, this idea that you're not responsible for the impact you have on others is preposterous we are one what happened to that we're one we are one if if my foot is sick then i'm gonna feel i'm sick right. <laughs> you know it doesn't it's not just my foot my whole every my experience of my day changes because of it well, there is a, a balance there, not to go into spiritual bypass, but also to learn that you can't make me angry. You have an impact, but the anger is my own anger. So it's actually learning to take responsibility for our emotional response, but that's not a bypass to you or to me, not understanding when I do this, it creates the impact and her reaction is anger. So that's where it all comes down to compassion. We have to yeah. compassionately understand the impact. So, and, and by having enough compassion for ourselves, then we can look at the hard shit we don't want to look at. Yeah, absolutely. And also to understand, listen, y'all, people talk about anger like we're not ever supposed to be angry. And that's a problem. That is. In, the, in the same way that rape culture is created partly because women can't say yes. Women are not allowed to consent because if you consent, you're a whore and being a whore is uh, unacceptable in our society. Um, so, so what is yes and what does no mean? If you can't say yes and, you're, and, and women are saying no all the time when they mean yes, then of course there's confusion, confusion there. And I know that's a controversial thing to say, but we really need to simultaneously, if we're going to talk about consent, we have to make it okay to consent. Yes. <laughs> right. It needs to be okay for women to say, I want to have sex. Yes. That needs to be okay. And, and this is part of the, this is also a part of the, the oppressive system is that we're taught, especially women, to, to say yes when we mean no. Um, what's that common thing? Oh, 
women give sex for love and men give love for sex. Right. That that particular that's so fucking toxic. That's also the codependency. It's not true. There is the like that's we have to start. We have to start telling the truth. We have to start. Well, we have to get into our bodies and learn how to fucking tell the truth, and then we can actually listen for, to someone else's truth and hold yeah, it. And, and we got to understand that we've yeah. been manipulated to be averse to that discomfort. Yes. There is no way to be in a state of attraction and and not feel uh, your homeostasis is being disrupted. That's why when you find someone who is who's who really has a, a strong integrity practice who takes accountability you're like ooh, that person's sexy <laughs> you're like whoa that yes. person's different it's because yeah. it's so unique right yeah. and this could be the way we change the world i i agree 100 <laughs> percent kind of a modern day lysistrata happening <laughs> oh listen i don't know if you know this about me but every now and then when i get on my uh my sexism rants i always hashtag lysistrata in there because i'm like if we stop cooperating with it, perhaps, you know, <laughs> perhaps those with, especially for women with privilege, white women um, can, can end a lot of this stuff. Yes. Like if white women stop putting up with it, if white women stop um, supporting the, the white male dominance and centering, then this would end. If stop mm -hmm. shaving your legs, we wouldn't have to, that wouldn't be a thing anymore. Hello? Gender roles, beauty standards. Who <laughs> came up with that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. At this point, you have to like, you have to, if, if you're going to make me put makeup on, or if you want me to put makeup on, it has, you have to give me something. Like, I have to get something out of that. Yeah. I want to read some comments. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Mark, again, writes, the most important thing to learn is grace and love. Unconditional love means little without conditions. Thank you for showing us the way, Reverend Bridge. Mm -hmm. I'm humbled and honored to receive your message. Um, I, I want to like. Uh, there was something that I started saying, and I got off on a on a side <laughs> side rant. <laughs> but I, I want to go back to anger for a moment. All oh, right. Uh, anger is a natural part of our natural impulses. We have the ability to cry. We have the ability to be angry. We have the ability to feel uh, discernment for danger. These are all natural parts of our uh, mental capacity. So to, to make those things wrong, like a blanket rule that they're always wrong, it's not okay. It's not healthy. And, and it, what it does is it's, it silences people from protecting themselves, from defending themselves. And then we call them victims. Oh, well, I've got to say a couple of things on anger because it's one of my favorite things to teach about. First off, my favorite story in the Bible was when Jesus got pissed. Oh right? yeah. And I mean, that, oh, okay, cool. Dude, dude had some passion. They left a little bit of passion in the Bible. He said this little milk toast, blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus, right? Anyway. Well, it was only okay because it was money. It was about money. Right, right. Um, want, you know, the poor, the the common folk should not be obsessed with money. It will anger Jesus. Oh, that's interesting. I've never had that spin on. Darn, and I like that story. <laughs> I like but, that story too. Um, you know, about anger, what's really important because many people in the spiritual community do believe that anger is bad. Mm -hmm. Thank you for what you said. It is a natural human emotion. And it's not okay to use anger as an entitlement to hurt someone. Yes. But it absolutely is healthy to, when we see anger, our own or another, to be curious, what are the needs and values that haven't been met that are underneath the anger so yes. I can understand you. Absolutely. Or I can understand myself. And that's absolutely. healthy. Absolutely. And if we talk about, if we talk about um, racism, and this has been going on for hundreds of years and people of color have been asking for this to end asking for it 
voting for it, demonstrating peacefully for it, working really hard to, to talk to people about it stopping. And it's met with violence mm. every time. Even Martin Luther King, uh, Mandela, both were met with violence. So, so to, to say that it's not okay to be angry when people are being killed, people are, are suffering. And, and it's, I really want people to, to realize that this is a, when we get triggered by that, it's our fear because we live in a punitive society. And what we could do instead, which is it's something that we probably mostly know that we would do with our loved ones. If, if a loved one is upset, we want to know what's the matter. Absolutely. We want to know what's the matter. And if we've done something that hurt them, we want to know, right? <laughs> we don't want to, most of the time, if we're healthy, I would say, <laughs> we want we to know. Have, we have a couple of questions I want to get to. Host G. Misha He asks, he says, first of all, yes, it's toxic. This kind of libertarian, I don't have any responsibility for my impact on you stuff. Um, please speak to that more. Mm. You know, <laughs> as a metaphysician, I've spent a lot of time studying the hermetic principles. And one of those principles is cause and effect. It is, it exists on every realm. Mm. Cause and effect is one of the universal principles. It exists on every realm. So does reciprocity. Mm. I don't know that there needs to be anything else said about that. This is a spiritual and physical plane principle that exists. I'm sorry, it's spiritual, mental, and physical. All three of the great planes of existence um, are bound to that principle, cause and effect. For every cause, there is an effect. For every effect, there is a cause. Nothing is just happening out of nowhere. And even if, for example, I have trauma, and you do something uh, that triggers that trauma, don't you want to know? Like, why don't you want to know? Because, because of shame. Because I don't want to know because it might trigger, my, my ego is very evolved at protecting me mm -hmm. from looking at things that are gonna trigger my shame and I spend a lot of time and energy managing that. So please don't reflect back to me what a horrible human being I am. Yeah, how about we stop okay. with this shame and stuff and understand that we've been conditioned. Well, that's why I, I want to ask you about the shame because you see, that's it. The people I know who are the most self-reflective, mm -hmm. there's like this, you're either on like a cycle of becoming self-reflective and finding true self-love, which allows you to look at the hard stuff Mm -hmm. versus a certain recent president that we had, who's a wonderful role model for absolutely unwilling to look at anything he might have done that could have had a negative impact or could have lost. I mean, why why would he did those things on purpose? Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> what was there for him to look at? It it's an incredible color. example. I mean, yeah. wow. I mean, and we all have some of that inside of us, right? Sure, yeah. So when am I unwilling to look at something because I'm so afraid of what that mirror, what that reflects? Yeah, so well, shame, I believe, is the aversion to being revealed. So can right. you really say, say that again? Shame is the aversion to that which wants to be revealed. That's a good one. Yeah. So, so when, when, we, when we hear people say, uh, stop shaming people, what, we're, what, what people are responding to is someone having said in a public way, this is not okay, this is harmful what you did. And just the act of, Marianne Williamson did, did this a couple of years ago, by the way. Um, she had been invited to be on a panel for a, a, a conference that was called something around about uh, goddess, ritual, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> something about ancient. Remember the goddess within. Yeah. Something, something with, you know, goddess and, 
and did you know like not indigenous but ancient ritual or something like that and every single person on the panel was white and uh someone called her out and asked her why why would she be on a on a panel that wasn't diverse mm. and her response was why are you trying to shame me mm. and and then she started to berate the people who were questioning her even though they were being they were not saying any negative things about her they just asked her a question and we're trying to explain to her why it's a problem that people don't stand up and say you need a diverse panel because there are people like me who do the work i do who listen it, it, this it's i'm only beginning to get um in, invites like this one to come and speak uh -huh. um and i've been doing this work for for quite some time even before i focused it specifically on racism it's not actually racism work. It's, it's healing um, the parts of us that have been sort of stripped and, and uh, muzzled and uh, th threatened in ways that have us be in fear and feeling helpless and hopeless so that we behave in ways that don't actually benefit us as a collective. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we, we, I've been running this course now for two and a half years. And um, a couple of runs ago, we had a woman who joined us and she had a condition called aphasia. And what that means is that she couldn't read blocks of text. And we were still running the course on a Facebook group at the time. And so it was really hard for her to keep up with the, the big text threads. And, um, there was a misunderstanding and she felt like she'd been discriminated against and she called us ableist and I have this flash of, oh my God, oh my God, I'm, I'm teaching diversity here. What am, I, <laughs> what am I gonna do? You know, should I argue back and forth with her? Should I defend myself? I actually feel, I had a chance to feel what that feels like. And what I decided was to pause, take a breath, and practice what I preach. How about wow. that? Yeah. <laughs> so even though I felt those things, I felt embarrassed, I felt threatened. I felt like the work I'm doing was threatened and it means a lot to me, this work. And I had to stop and ask myself, what do you want, Bridge? What do you want? I want her to stay in the course and I want her to get what she came here for, period. So I called her up and I said, look, I'm so sorry. I understand that there was this misunderstanding here. It was not your fault. We screwed up, we fucked up. We're still figuring this out. And how can I make it up to you? Beautiful. Well, I just can't, I can't read the stuff. And I said, well, tell you, I tell you what, I'm gonna give you your money back. And in a couple of months, come back once we have our campus up and running, we'll have, audio, uh, audio, what do you call it? Audio readers Close for captioning. every, Close captioning. no, no, no. Audio readers, <laughs> like voice reading. Yeah. So it's, it's like, it's, what do you call those? Uh, it's audio like, book, like an audio book for the uh, course. All oh, right, right, okay, right, right, right. It was actually really helpful for me as well. Oh, really? That's good. Yeah, it was. I get lost a lot That's, and I, oh. I, I would listen and read at the same time. I would follow along. It was so good for me. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. So we, we decided, I mean, early on when we were designing this, this uh, campus, we decided to make sure it was accessible. And so every single lesson, because there's a lot of reading, every single lesson has audio readers on it. And um, so when she came back, she came back with her son and her husband and from doing the work in the course, uh, by the way, the husband and wife were almost separating, about to have a divorce when she was in the class before. And when they took the course together, the principles and practices we give them at the beginning help them to save their marriage and they're still together. <laughs> so, so this is why I say this is not really about race, even though we're using the, these things to apply them to race, 
I'm going to be, I'm create, I have other courses as well that teach those same principles. Every client, every private client I have, every uh, course that I teach, we will always teach these things first because I think they're at the root of all suffering. I think that all uh, disintegration that we uh, transmit or project onto each other or onto ourselves uh, comes out of having been programmed to think differently from what we're teaching. So uh, we start by grounding into there's no right and wrong, there's no good versus evil. There's no shame, there's no guilt. We don't do this. What we do is we practice integrity. We try and be as much uh, on a righteous path as we can. Um, and when we're not, because we're human, we uh, try and notice that ourselves. And if we don't notice it ourselves and someone else does, then we take it in and we take accountability. And if, yeah. and if it's not true, if we're not out of integrity, then we don't have to take it in. But it, you have to actually wanna know <laughs> whether you're out of integrity or not. And, and, then, and then if you notice you are, we don't even teach shame, shame or smallness around the, restoration, the restoration of integrity. What we teach people is to be joyous or um, proud to, to, to restore integrity. So, hey, my bad. I, I know that I did this. I know it affected you in this way. And um, how can I make it right? See, I, I want to break that up is so just for everyone watching is that you recognize like something happened and you recognize that you need to shift. And this is exactly the racist conversation, like the anti-racist conversation that we're in is like, okay, I recognize that my impact on someone else, just because it's not my experience, it's impacting someone else. Oh, now I get to pivot and without throwing, you know, like kicking and screaming about it. It's just like, oh, I get to shift things. I get to acknowledge what I've done, how it impacted someone and how I can change my behavior. I believe for myself that I am greater. I am more empowered. I'm more powerful when I can own my impact in the world. Yes. If I'm giving it away, I'm giving away my power. So no, very self-empowered to be able to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's also loving. It's yeah. very, very loving to it's real acknowledge. Love. It's not ooey gooey gooey bullshit love. Yes. It's real love to be able to own, oh wow, when I do this, it impacts you in this way. And to be present to mutual understanding. Why did I do that? I didn't do it for the purpose of hurting you intentionally. Mm -hmm. I did it need some need or value. And which of your values and needs were not met by that action? and really going into compassionate, mutual understanding, that's real love. That's real friendship. That's real healthy relationship. So I, I, teach, I, I teach love is a, uh, is a state of being that just is. Love is the truth. Love is. I teach love is, uh, is oneness. Okay, so if love is the truth, it, alwa it always is, then what we experience is a disillusionment with the truth, a disassociation from the truth. So whenever we uh, separate ourselves in the physical plane or in the mental plane from someone, we are out of alignment with what is true and it causes us and the other person suffering. So um, that's what it's about for me. That's what integrity is for me. It's being committed to oneness. I am. Um, I'm going to go back to your website. Somebody asked, and I put it in the chat box. But you were talking about your different courses, and I really think it is to get a better sense of who you are. Just to look at these courses: critical, right? Critical truth theory, not just critical race theory. Critical truth theory, world history rehabilitation. Embodied movement, heal thyself. That's the, the one that we want everybody to take. And I, I really will think about it. It's the time thing is, the time thing is, is what's struggling for me. Holistic business practices and initiates path. Deeping, deep diving into multidisciplinary priest and priestesshood. 
it's sold out, but I still want to hear a little bit about that. Tell us about that one. Well, let me tell you about all of these real briefly. Oh, we'll leave it up there so I can remember which one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. All right. So uh, first of all, the Remember Institute Open House is there all the time. It's free. You can just go into the courses section and click on it and you'll be able to watch videos from the teachers and from myself and from some of the students who've taken the course. Um, and then we have some courses that are only available to people who have, uh, who've, who've actually taken the Heal Thyself course because it's a part of the curriculum for diversity consciousness, which is the study path for diversity consciousness. Um, so holistic business practices, for example, is one of those. Holistic business practice, um, we uh, require that you have already taken the Heal Thyself course. And in that course, we it's a five month long experience where business owners um, do a, a study of their own business and find places in their business where they can improve, improve their inclusivity, um, improve their awareness around their clients' needs. And um, it is, we're in about the, we're in the fourth month now of this particular run of that course. And it is amazing. I mean, the students are doing presentations about what they're gonna do in their, their businesses to make a difference. And it's beautiful to watch. Um, Initiates Path is a year long study program. It's very intense. We, this, this is our first time running it. We started out with something like 30 people and now we're down to 10. Um, wow. we, um, we use the Cabalion, um, the um, A Course in Miracles and several other, uh, I'm trying to think what else, Hermeticism. So uh, a few books on Hermeticism um, to bring the students into deep study and deep practice. They're doing multidisciplinary journaling. Uh, so what I mean by that is they have like, they have a journal where they draw pictures of what they're learning or things that stand out for them. And, and what they're doing is over this year, they choose at the beginning a desire that they have that they would like to achieve. And it has to be something that feels slightly impossible or very difficult. And so we apply all of the things they're studying to the manifestation of that desire. And the, the goal is at the end to have either, um, <laughs> either have achieved manifesting that desire or realizing that they didn't really desire that thing in the first place and there was something behind it. So we're, we're it's, a, it's a deep program. It's the first of three years, um, this particular run. Uh, there's a phase two and a phase three as well uh, in the coming years. Uh, but the people who are taking that course desire to either be teachers for Remember Institute or they want to um, enhance their own teaching and healing practices. So this is kind of more actually just for my own edification. I run the Love Coach Academy, I teach courses. How was it for you, you your first time doing a year long, you started with 30 and you're down to 10. How was that for you? I knew it was gonna happen. Uh, I mean, the, it's intentionally difficult. The course is intentionally difficult. Um, I believe that if you are going into any sort of ministry of any sort, you should be committed. Mm -hmm. And that in order for you to be a good teacher, you have to know your subject. And so it's a play, it's a it's an environment where my students are, um, getting acquainted with their subjects and learning how to how to overcome mental blockages and uh, physical plane evidence that's contrary to what they want to do and um, it's deep it's deep <laughs> there's a lot of ancestral work happening and um, projecting forward as well and uh, I, I'm learning a lot from the students. Actually, it's 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 a really deeply um, penetrating experience. Yeah, beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, we're almost out of time. I want to take a quick look. Deborah, we do have a couple of things. Um, 
Deborah writes, how do we work through racism and count, come out on the other side when the majority of racist people have no desire or need to change? You kind of addressed that. Patricia actually addressed it by just living it. But is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at the history of the world and study different societies, you see that change, things do change over time. And um, understanding the system that is manipulating us is the first step. We've seen things change in this society even. And the fact that we're having people talk openly about these things. Um, I live in a, in a predominantly middle-class white neighborhood. And this past year was the first time I've ever seen so many white people in the streets talking about Black Lives Matter. <laughs> I just, and it shocked me. I like stood in my window and I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> and, and that took people witnessing someone be killed in front of them. On, oh, and, on and that particular murder, because I, I'll own that I've often thought to myself, okay, the cop got scared, he pulled the trigger. It takes two seconds to pull the trigger, mm -hmm. but nine minutes on a man's neck when people around are begging you to get off of him and he's clearly not dangerous. It was, it was, it was a, it wasn't just a murder. It was a torturous murder that was so yeah. in our faces that we and could he's smiling you know, and he's looking around and yeah, nobody he was proud knows. of himself. Yeah. He was proud of himself. Mm -hmm. And and so yeah, what was, people don't understand that is that I mean, and this is not so far fetched fetched. I don't know why it's so hard to understand, but guess what attracts people to that particular job? Either they want to be a hero or they want to have have power over people. M most people um go in there with a fantasy of being a hero mm -hmm. and they don't know the history of policing in the united states policing in the united states started as slave catching patrols mm -hmm. yes i mean that is the actual fact wow. it started as slave catching patrols so um and, and the way that the system is set up it, it doesn't support police officers mental health, it doesn't support their, um, you know, their capacity for de-escalation or these kind of tools. So, and they're, they're having to deal with things that actually mental health professionals should be dealing with. Yes. You know, so uh, it, it, it's, 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 not a, it's not a good system um, and it's designed that way because it, it, the people that go to jail work for corporations now. Most of the prisons are um, are private. Mm -hmm. This is a big industry. Very and big industry. Companies make a lot of money off of this free labor, once again, slavery <laughs> in this country. Yeah. And you can't just say, well, they shouldn't have done the crime. Well, how do you know they did the crime? Or, or, or was that crime even, uh, is, that, is that crime, um, <laughs> sufficient to deem that person a slave. Yes. And again, it often it's because of circumstances, you know, like you were, were like we talked about before, you, you can't live on $15 an hour. So if you can't live on $15 an hour and you don't have other options, you, you, look, we all ultimately take care of ourselves. And most of us, if taking care of myself, ultimately means I have to break the law and I think I can get away with it. Most of oh, us, yeah, yeah, still some food. Forced, still, yeah. yeah, exactly. And I think that's not to but it's to acknowledge it. Uh, Barbara writes, by the way, Barbara wrote earlier, um, I love you, Reverend Bridge Feltis. Me too. Uh, and many, many people, I think. And, and she's really thanking you. She said, Reverend Feltis, you and your words are so beautiful and enlightening. Thank you. Um, and then Barbara also writes just now, it's a completely broken system with so many broken people. A couple of other uh, from our audience. Um, Mark writes, I feel that most of the resistance that white people have toward accepting equality is from rejection. They feel that POC will behave as reprehensibly and murderously as the white supremacists have. 
It's a difficult one to overcome because the supremacists have to confront the truth about themselves. Love, you know that there are millions of us on the planet and we haven't done it yet. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, not, then, it's not our, our, our personal culture. It is not our, it's not what we want. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, there are some who, who do feel that way, who, who do feel murderous uh, towards white people. There are, but they're not in power. And, and this is not what's being asked for. And, and listen, that's a paradigm we need to overcome, that, that we don't make decisions out of fear, that we make decisions out of what's righteous. Like what, what is the best for humanity? Not um, being afraid of each other. Like we need to come, if, if that were to happen, it's because that we're trying to hold on to things like uh, capitalism as it is today, or uh, you know something like that. If we're still trying to keep the same system and put somebody else in power, sure, maybe that's gonna happen. But I, I just, I think the whole system is gonna have to be disassembled. And I think somewhere in us, we all know that. And this is why we're so reluctant to have the conversation, because it's scary. It's scary to me. I'm like, oh my gosh, what's gonna happen? And I can, and I can say that because I do have some privilege and some of those things might go away. And, and I'm, I'm willing, I'm willing. I'm willing. I'm, I'm ready. I think I'm ready. I'm willing. I want to be willing. If I'm being really honest, like, because it's easy to say the words, but then Hello. what does that really look like? What am I really going to lose? And yeah, you no. Know, um, so again, if, like, if, if, if you start, and so we know what that really means. Yeah. Most of well, us yeah. raise our hand, right? Yes, because we see ourselves as separate. We think that we can somehow hold on to what we have while somebody else suffers. And I'm gonna tell you, one of the things we talk about early on in my course is that I see myself as your sister. So if, if it were your sister, you'd give anything for her. That's right. Like I have to be willing to see you as my equal, as my, as my brother, as, as, as a part of me. And until we start um, promoting that, we have to start promoting that. And yes, there, there are situations, listen, the, the truth is broad and varied and many things are true at the same time, right? We have the capacity to see ourselves as separate and we also have the capacity to see ourselves as one. And we need to, be, we need to learn how to be dynamic. We need to learn how to uh, understand when it's appropriate to see ourselves as individuals, mm -hmm. obviously, because it's the individual driving a car. <laughs> Scott won't drive the car for me from wherever he is on the planet. <laughs> I have to drive the car. I have to go to my job and do my work. And we are a collective uh, organism. We are one. We are connected to each other. What happens to me happens to this entire society. It's an injury to humankind. <sighs> That's the, again, I always like to read what our people are writing, and there's a couple of things here. Um, you're going to love this one. Dia Therese from Boise, Idaho, turning 80 this year. Oh. No, no, in 212 weeks. Oh, in 212 <laughs> weeks. Okay, so that's in four years. Okay, approximately. She says, the depth of your sharings on this show makes my heart sing. Oh. Beginner's mind always. Namaste. So yeah. 76. You 76. are approximately around the age of my parents. And um, I know that you've lived through some some phases in humanity's story that, um, you know, had to happen, I believe, and certainly did not quite meet the mark yet. Mm -hmm. And I hope that when you, when you witness the work I'm doing that you see that we're carrying on the work of generations before me and that we try and just improve with each generation. You know, that's, I think that's enough to say that we are actually actively committed yes. to mankind, to humanity. Barbara, our last comment right now in the Zoom room writes, yes, but I'm afraid of raising fear in others. Mm. 
going to be scary for others. So that's really honest, Barbara. And anything, Reverend Feltis, you want to say about that? I would say the fear is already there. Yeah. Mm. I would say the only way to alleviate the fear is to be in action. Like yeah. fear is a fantasy or an imagining of what could go wrong. And that the only thing, the only control we have over that, because that's future projection, only control we have over that is what we do right now. Like whether or not I choose right now that I am your your sister and I would I would protect you, I would defend you, and I would expect you to protect me and defend me as well. And that you can accept that whatever fairy tale you you were taught just isn't true. It's not true. There are actually people who benefit off of these things. And they're committed to that. There's not gonna be any talking them out of it. You, you, we've got people <laughs> making trillions of dollars um, and spending it on going to, uh, for two minutes into outer space. And there are people- That's not exactly, you got 10 minutes in this little short ride. Man, uh, this is <laughs> preposterous to me. We have to wrap up. But I also want to thank you for your compassion. Mm. And you know, just in terms of what you were just saying, we also have to confront the existential crisis that occurs when we do realize what we believed isn't true. Oh. Right? I remember when I first realized, because I, I grew up you know, playing with little toy soldiers, and the Americans defeated the Nazis, the Germans, because they were evil. right? And, we were the good guys. And as I be, got older and began to learn about what my government does mm -hmm. and is doing, mm -hmm. the existential crisis took me years of, oh my God, we're not the good guys anymore. We're not the good guys, we're the bad guys. Absolutely. And that I will is, never forget, um, oh. I was living in Germany, this is 20 years ago, and I was I was living in Germany and at the time I was working as a makeup artist and hairstylist for film. And we, uh, the team that I was working with, we flew to Moscow. It was my first time ever uh, going to the, 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 behind the Iron Curtain. Of course the Iron Curtain's not the Iron Curtain anymore at that point, but um, landing, first of all, uh, when the plane landed, everybody on the plane that was Russian, yeah! Because they they don't uh, they didn't um, they didn't assume that they were going to land safely. That's number one. Wow! Uh, and they pulled out the the vodka. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody, I mean, they literally cheered, jumped up out of their seats when they landed. And then the second thing I remember is walking the streets of Moscow, and how friendly everyone was, and how cheerful people were. And I went to the, the flea market, it was called Leningradsky Square. And uh, the people there were so nice and so friendly and it wasn't depressing. And, and I grew up in the 60s and 70s. So mm -hmm. during that time, people talked about this place like it was someplace you would never want to go. And the people are miserable. And this is just a, a, a place of complete misery and darkness. I, I clearly remember that. And so being there and connecting with people, realizing oh, I've been lied to. People are people everywhere. And realizing there's so many of those kinds of things we're taught in order to sort of create allegiance or mm -hmm. yes, create this uh, commitment to serve this this system, this com this country, and it was all necessary because if they didn't do all of that, nobody would have put up with all of this. <laughs> well, in order you have to demonize a human being in order to hurt them. The more that we demonize that person, the more capable we are of pulling the trigger or dropping the bomb. Sure, you know? that's how we dehumanize emotions, mm -hmm. and especially. I mean, that was one of the, the hardest things for me or the most harmful things is like anger is wrong and bad and, and sadness is a lower vibration. And like that's very human. And so, so I mean, can you, can you love anyone and witness them being hurt or lose them to uh, death 
when they lose their body and not feel sad? Is it possible that any human being who is not in some way uh, disabled doesn't feel sad ever? It's a, it's a natural part of humanity. It's all, of, all of the uncomfortable emotions, but even the terminology of bad feelings, yeah. and negative emotions. No, they're not bad or negative. They're uncomfortable. Yes. That's all. Uncomfortable. Yeah. Also, uh, the idea of negative vibrations uh, or high vibrations and low vibrations. Don't get me started, Trish. <laughs> we should have conversations. <laughs> Actually, I just, I, yeah, I, yeah. Before, she has a story about like, that. But no, people happening. people talk a lot about avoiding people with negative vibes. I'm like, why should I do that? My vibration is potent. I can drown out or transmute their vibration. How about that? Yeah, I just don't one. see them as even negative or positive. It's it's just it's just frequency. It is what it is, and and if I want to shift the frequency, I can. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Eleanor Joy writes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 79 plus 4.5 months and i'm still legal to learn and i'm grateful for all of this oh my god god bless you Eleanor joy god you, bless you god bless you everybody who's watching you know please share this show that's a really wonderful you know it's free we're not getting we're not paying her we're not getting paid we're providing this as a service you can show us a little love by put this on your wall take you go up grab the link it's real easy grab the url send out an email to people that you think might want to watch this um, and really take Reverend Rich's course. Uh, register before August 4th to get that 30% off. I'm really going to think about it. I, she will tell you, I'm not exaggerating. I work, I work 12 to 15 hours a day, six and a half days a week. Yeah. You might want to do this when you have a slow period. Uh, well, that, however, you're going to have to intentionally take a slow period. Yeah, I know. Because <laughs> really, for six weeks, it's like I'd ask her to do things. She said, I can't. I've got my homework. I've I would like to just say <laughs> that I planned the six weeks. You did? And then you gave me a job. <laughs> <laughs> but when you asked me to do things, I had already prioritized. She, had, she, had already, she made it many times. I lost, I lost her to you, or lost you know, our time. I, you lost yeah. me to my commitment to humanity for my love and my compassion. Ooh. For Ooh. everyone, She's I didn't take the course Ooh. for me. That's not. It's not about me. I understand because this. Listen, it's the course is not designed to be easy to take. It's not designed to be comfortable. You will feel things in the course, and we actually help people learn how to process feeling. We talk about somatics and practices to process as you're going through the course. So it is all of that, and. Uh, we've had people take the course when they were two weeks away from uh, their due date on their pregnancy. We've wow. had people get married while they were on the course. We've had people with uh, multi-million dollar businesses who took the course. Um, people tra world traveling <laughs> while they were taking okay. the course. All right, all right. I, people all camping. Right. People during the wildfires who got evacuated in the middle of the course. Took I, the I course. live in that. Area. Yep, yep, Not yep. to be slightly um, aggressive, but I'm just going to ask, <laughs> what are you actually committed to? And are you just committed to talking about it or being in action? And, and that's, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So if you're really committed to And my action is, I want to, you know, when I heard you say a few minutes ago that you aren't getting invited on that many shows, well, you know, right away it's like, oh, well, that's going to change. <laughs> um, that's definitely going to change because I, I do. I want to get you out to as many people as I can. Awesome. Uh, we've and already we've... decided the next time we have an in-person Bay Area retreat, we want you to come and teach a day. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, for our love coaches. Will you come um, on my show and teach self-love? Like nah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I All right. No, I will. <laughs> Mark, thank you for doing that. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, Mark. Um, Reverend Bridge, thank you. Um, thank I really you am so grateful for who you are, the work you're doing, and that yes. you're doing it with so much love, mm, so much you. patience, and so much compassion, and shame free. That is really, really no small thing. Yeah, well, you have to understand something. We don't actually care about you being guilty. <laughs> 
I mean, that, how is that fixing anything? We, we actually need to get in here together and get some stuff done. <laughs> yes. Well, and, and that shows that you're not looking at it from the, the old paradigm, blame, shame, punishment model. Yeah, it's not adversarial. Right, right, exactly. This exactly. is about healing. And That's it's, why it's called heal thyself. Guilt <laughs> and shame are, are for self, I think. That's how I see it. And so is an apology. Mm -hmm. That's why the restoration of integrity is so powerful is because it's not, it's not about me. In fact, it has, it, it's none of my feelings are in there. And I thought that was a really powerful place to step into the world. It's like, oh, this is what happened. It's yeah. actually relieving to yeah. practice that practice. It's way more humane than an apology. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's so much more loving. Reverend Fridge, thank you so much. Everybody, again, remember, go to rememberinstitute.com. Rememberinstitute.com. That's where you can learn all about what she's doing. And who knows, I just might see you in that August course. And I know I'll talk to you one way or the other. <laughs> thank you very much for your time. God thank bless you. All. God bless. Take care.